Um, uh, today's uh, lesson doesn't really have a title. Perhaps if it did, um, it would be the uh, countercultural superpower. Uh, maybe something like that. Uh, listening to that song there, you know, it was talking about how powerful scripture is. And, you know, I'm only going to do seven verses tonight uh, because, frankly, there's so much in in this chapter that it deserves uh, more than one session. Uh, but uh, there's there's a lot in those seven verses and uh, they're very, very powerful. And tonight it's uh, quite interactive. So there's going to be some questions. So... Um, uh, do you know? There's, do feel free to speak and uh, to 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 say what you think, to shout out, to to use the message thing maybe on what you think. But uh, there's going to be some questions to answer, so uh, no one's allowed to sleep. I don't know how that's going to work for the recording, but uh, there you go. Uh, we're here to learn, aren't we? So let's start with a question. Um, you know, this is this builds this builds um, on uh, last week's lesson. Um, on Christian submission. So here's the first question. In chapter two, to whom should the Christian submit? How about all of the above? Yeah. Mm. yeah. All of the above. Answer so all of them. Yeah. So if we if we were to go back to First Peter chapter two, um, you know, uh, it mentions the king in verse 13, gentle masters in 18. The king and his governors, so the, the governors is just in the, the, the verse after the king. Uh, your conscience in verse 19, uh, unreasonable masters as well as the gentle masters in verse 18, and God um, in, in 2.16. So all of those people were supposed to submit to. And uh, so what's going on here is that we're continuing the same, uh, the same conversation. So you can see that in First Peter, uh, we had a you know we had the royal priesthood from verses one to twelve. Uh, this is in, in chapter two, sorry. Um, and then we had you know submit as a citizen in verses thirteen to seventeen. Then we had submit as a servant in verses eighteen to twenty. So you can imagine that's where the kings and governors were, and that's where the reasonable and unreasonable master was in there. And then, then there's a sort of a bit of the gospel, and Peter goes on about Christ suffered, you know, so he's saying, look, you know, submit to authority, submit to your masters, submit to your bosses, submit as a servant, because, you know, Christ suffered and, and died for you, and he did it, you know, putting up with all the injustice and uh, unfairness that came on his head, and, and, and the uh, obedience and submission that he had to show. Um, and then when we continue into chapter three, because probably these letters weren't chopped into chapters uh, the way they are in our Bible, uh, we then have uh, verses one to six, submit as wives. And then we have, uh, you know, verse seven, honor wives. Um, and then we have verses eight to 18. Again, uh, you know, our suffering with purity uh, because Christ suffered. Um, and then finally, at the end of the chapter, you've got a bit about the gospel, you've got baptism, and now all subject to Christ. And that's why, you know, with all that going on, it's quite difficult to, to cover all that in this kind of session in, in one evening. So tonight, um, we're going to focus on First Peter chapter 3, uh, verses uh, 1 to 7. And I, th I think you can see a bit of a pattern there. Now, um, I don't really... I can't claim to understand why Peter did it this way, um, but, you know, you can see, you know, he talks that there's two sort of sections on submission and then Christ's suffering to say, you know, you know, you should submit because Christ suffered and died for you. And then we have it again in chapter three, you know, you should submit and you should honor because Christ and, and suffer uh, because of Christ's suffering and, and death and resurrection. Um, and uh, and now are subject to him. So there is definitely a pattern there, and maybe a greater mind than mine can work out why that is. So uh, let's read First Peter chapter three, verses one to seven. In the same way, you wives, uh, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any one of if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the, the without a word by the behavior of their wives, 
as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart uh, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right, without being frightened by any fear. Your husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honour as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, there's a massive amount in there. Um, there, really, there really is, and we're going to unpack a lot of it tonight. Um, okay. So, um, one thing to bear in mind is the context. Um, and uh, normally when people talk about context, it means they're going to sort of water down all the word and, and say, you know, because of this and because of that, this doesn't really mean this. Uh, but actually, I'm not going to say that at all. Um, but I just want to be clear that um, if we go back to First Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, you know, he's, to all those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, uh, you, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God with the Father by the sanctified work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Um, P Peter is preaching to people living outside of Israel, um, where clearly some of the women uh, reading this were not married to Christians. And you can imagine for those women, they had a lot of questions on their mind. You know, if I'm married to someone who's not a Christian, uh, what is my, you know, kind of relationship to him? Um, you know, um, you know, am I superior to him? You know, should I try and convert him? Should I preach to him? What, what should I do with, with this man? Um, but just because we have this con context to bear in mind, it uh, doesn't mean this, uh, this piece of text um, is necessarily just for people um, in this situation. Um, we'll, we'll see that in a minute. So, um, question two. Uh, so this is the interactive bit. To whom are verses one to six addressed? To whom are verses one to six addressed? All women, Christian women, wives with non-believer husbands, wives with believer husbands, Christian wives, wives of Peter's generation, wives of all generations sincere. Well, <coughs> I would say that strictly um, uh, one, one is no, uh, and two is, um, it's really about wives. Yeah, so in the simple sense, it's not a message to Christian women, but of course, some Christian women are Christian wives. So I would say it's question, the, the, the best answer is uh, number seven, wives of all generations sincere. And, uh, but logically, that includes three, four, five, and six. Yeah. Uh, and we saw clearly wives with non-believer husbands so it's saying if some of them uh, we go back to the text, um, the la, da, da, you know, your own husband, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, disobedient to the word meaning not aligned, not submitted to Christ. So in other words, if any of them means that some of them uh, will be obedient to the word. So we're talking about both uh, wives with non-believing husbands and believing husbands. Um, and then uh, the interesting bit is that, of course, a lot of people will say, yeah, but, you know, this, well, this was for Peter's generation. You know, this was um, something that's, you know, related to his culture. Um, the problem then is, is when you go uh, into the, the second part. So from verse five, for in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children, if you do what is right, without being frightened by any fear. By, by Peter sort of saying to his generation of wives, 
you know, look at what Sarah did, you know, and how she and, and women, um, uh, the holy women of, of, of previous generations, how they, um, you know, uh, honored their husbands and how they behaved, um, you know, you should be copying them. So you can imagine that although to us, Peter's time is 2000 years ago, um, it seems, you know, a long time ago and a very different world. But if you were in Peter's time and someone tried to tell you, you know, you, you could turn around and say, well, hold on, you know, why me? But he's saying, well, look, you know, these people another thousand years or 1300 years before, before then, um, you know, we should be doing this. So if, if it was right 1300 years before when this was written, um, it's right for us today because Peter's making a point that this is something that doesn't stop. You know, it continues from all that time over a thousand years between Sarah and Christ. Yeah. So I think that's a, a strong clue that this is relevant um, today. And there's another, there's another point that we'll come to in a minute. If it was right for all those women from the time of Sarah to, uh, to these Christian wives then, uh, then of course number five, Christian wives, is included in that. So I know it's quite complicated um, and I've got lots of options which could confuse people there, but really the point I'm trying to make is that if you don't read this carefully, um, it's easy to, under to think that this, this actually refers to someone else, you know. And really, it, it's it's not referring to all women. It's not a statement about uh, women being submissive to men. It's it's about wives being in submission to their husband uh, and, uh, and and approaching the way that they um, that they sort of treat their husbands and, and and sort of preach to their husbands through this quiet uh, action um, rather than than the direct, direct speech uh, and other other parts of it, in my view. So the next question is, what's the importance of imperishable in verse four? So I don't know if you've got your Bibles, but if we, if I read out verse four for you again, rather it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is, which is of great worth in God's sight. Actually, that's the, that's the NIV, but... Uh, we go back to here, verse four, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. So the question is, what's the importance of the word imperishable? I, I, I think there's different ways to take this, but the way I take this is that it's saying that this is something that is, um, let me just go back to the, uh, to the text. Um, so your dome must not be merely external, braiding of the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. I mean, we can look at it um, in terms of that it, it doesn't go down with age, say, so it doesn't fade, and that it... Um, uh, you know, that, you know, as a woman's beauty may potentially uh, diminish with age, that um, this internal beauty um, is uh, stays the same. Um, but I actually think um, there's another meaning here as well, and that is that it's permanent. You know, it's uh, the, the gentleness and the quiet spirit is something that's persistently beautiful to God and precious to God, right? Um, it's like an eternal thing of beauty, you know, this gentle and quiet spirit. So I, I think there's, uh, you know, two ways to look at that. So here's, here's a tricky one. Here's a super tricky question. Does God allow wives to wear adornments? I'll just go to the answer because, well, it's very complicated. Um, but I think the answer is yes. And... Um, the reason it's complicated is because if we look strictly just at First Peter 3, it depends which translation you're reading. Yeah. So in the NIV, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate ha hairstyles and wearing of gold jewellery or fine clothes. That doesn't forbid adornment. Um, 
Uh, but the ESV, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the, and the putting on of gold jewelry or the, clothe, or the clothing you wear. But, uh, so in some, some translations, um, you know, basically it's quite against, you know, the way it's been translated is quite against adornment. Um, in NASB, uh, your adornment must not be merely external. Uh, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewellery or putting on dresses. So in the NASB, the merely has been added, yeah, as an interpretation to say that, you know, you can be both internally and ex externally adorned, right? But that's not there in the ESV version. And in the NIV is pretty, pretty passive on it and, and isn't so bad. So um, depending on which kind of uh, translation you, you read, you can get different views on whether or not uh, you know you should be adorned, um, uh, you know, and externally with jewellery and uh, essentially because the hair braiding. Apparently, I've read somewhere in, in my research that uh, women of the time were importing uh, um, um, uh, what do you call them uh, uh, wigs, yeah, which is uh, I know close to uh, the church's heart. Um, wigs from Egypt and uh, and so this hair braiding actually although you can read it as uh, the women braiding their hair um, apparently according to some sources um, people were kind of buying braided wigs um, from Egypt uh, maybe because they were you know shaving themselves there or something I don't know and so they're wearing them as uh, you know uh, beautiful things now, um, so what's the, so, you know, when we've got these different scriptures, so they're saying, you know, slightly conflicting, different translations, slightly conflicting here. So the question is, well, which way should we look at this? Um, you know, do not let your adorning be external, you know. Um, but when we look at adornment a bit wider, we can see that actually adornment can be an act of giving. And, uh, and that's pretty nice. So if we look at Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, verse 6 to 14, uh, verse 11. So the whole, the, the area of 6 to 14 is really God talking about uh, Israel um, as a wife. And uh, it says, I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your hands and your neck, uh, on your neck and a necklace around your neck. I also put a ring on your nostril, earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Um, you know, so in other words, you know, Christ, sorry, Christ, uh, God, uh, you know, has adorned Israel with beautiful things, figuratively. And of course, you know, a few verses later, it goes on to talk about how even though God put uh, Israel in a beautiful dress and, uh, you know, wiped away, you know, the, the sort of bloody mess he found on her when he found her, um, you know, like she'd been in some accident, um, but he, he kind of, you know, cleaned her up gave her a beautiful dress, gave her a beautiful uh, ear, uh, jewellery and uh, all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, basically she, you know, quick, quite quickly goes off with someone else, you know, and that's, that's the kind of message there. Um, and then in Jeremiah 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 32, can a maid forgive, forget her ornaments or, or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me without uh, days without number. So, um, you know, God's saying here, well, you know, a maid's going to look beautiful, a bride's going to have all her bits to look uh, perfect for her wedding, um, and yet my people, you know, don't seem to remember their God. Um, and for some time, you know, we can't even count how many days it's been since they remembered me. So God, you know, there's a couple of examples where God is, is, sees adornment. As a beautiful thing but if you if you look at you know the example in Ezekiel God is giving adornment to uh, his bride um, as an act of love and affection and in the Jeremiah case here you know you've got the the maid with the adornment and the bride with her attire you know sort of giving you know wanting to look good um, for her husband or for her suitor or for her, um, her groom yeah, there's a kind of giving. It's not about personal um, pride here. It's about looking beautiful um, for the other party. So there's uh, <clears throat> adornment can be part of a, a gift uh, that we 
uh, you know, <clears throat> that we're giving to someone else, either through, a, you know, a gift to, to give for them to wear or, or to be beautiful for them to behold. Um, so we can see that adornment is not, not um, at least uh, not in the scripture I found, um, against God's will. But we do have to be careful a little bit on the translations there, um, because uh, depending on what you read, it can be a bit confusing. So if a wife's actual beauty does not come from her adornment, uh, where does it come from? Um, number one, chaste and respectful behaviour. Number two, a hidden part person of the heart. Number three, her lineage. Number four, a gentle and quiet spirit. So numbers one, two, and four. Yeah. Rather, it should be from your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet heart. Um, and uh, the chaste and respectful behaviour is actually um, further up in, in verse two, I think it is. Yeah. So, um, you know, so this is where the beauty comes from. And, and uh, now that, you know, that in itself is, um, you know, for the mature Christian is uh, not a, a sort of an earthquake in itself. Uh, but, you know, actually what we're starting to do is lead up to the kind of countercultural um, superpower. I, I think... Uh, um, you know, this is the, the really interesting bit. Let me just see here. So question six, how can this beauty be used powerfully for God's glory? Win over the unbeliever. Yeah, yeah. They may be won without a word by the behaviour of their wives. Now, you know, this is the... Uh, you know, this is super kind of countercultural, right? You know, um, but uh, we're in a world where, you know, we, we're taught that power is the way to, to win things. And, um, and here we're seeing the opposite. And uh, we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. So now for the big picture, you know, we, we've stepped through a lot of the verses and the things that are in them and the different points it's trying to make but um but actually uh you know it from these six seven verses we can actually see you know we can answer three questions here what does um this tell us about the character of god um you know what is a wife's 21st century countercultural superpower power and what does verse 7 tell us about the value of a wife in the first century? So there's actually a really interesting uh, contrast here, but not in the way you might expect. Even, even people, you know, even mature Christians might expect. Um, so let's, let's get through them. Now these, um, you know, these slides are a little bit busy and I apologize. But if we look at um, the question, what does first Peter uh, chapter 3, 1 to 7, tell us about the character of God. Um, it's building on, you know, what we've been learning uh, in chapter 2. You know, submit to authority, submit um, to our bosses and to our masters. And now, in this case, wives submit to husbands. And it's, it's saying that there is order. God is a God of order and not chaos. Yeah, it's part of his character. Um, if we look through the New Testament, you know, there are so many examples of Jesus' submission. You know, Jesus submitted to his parents, uh, demons submitted to the disciples, citizens should submit to the government authority, uh, the universe will submit to Jesus, uh, unseen spiritual beings submit to Jesus, Christians should submit to the church leaders, wives should submit to husbands, uh, the church should submit to Jesus, servants should submit to masters. Christians should, should submit uh, to God, you know, so this is, you know, there is structure, um, there, there's structure in the, in the universe, because if you think back even in the days of Genesis, at the very beginning of, of the Bible, um, you know, God created uh, the universe in a structured way, step by step, creating beauty and organization 
from chaos, you know, you know, he was passing over the waters, you know, the spirit of God passed over the waters and it was unformed. Um, and he, you know, he said, let there be light and there was light and there was dark and, and, uh, and there was the first day and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, God, part of his character is that, you know, God, God loves order. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and he wants, he wants us to see and, and, and understand the different uh, relationships that are, you know, the relate the relationship between believer and church, uh, the, the, the relationship between church and Christ, between Christ and the father, between wives and husbands, between children and parents, between servants and masters. There's a relationship to say that you are inside a structure ordained by God which is there to give glory to God and for your benefit. So, you know, in the, um, in the Old Testament, we, had the, we saw the example in Ezekiel of structure where God, you know, effectively, you know, had Israel as his bride, saying, you know, I took you, I, I rescued you, I cleaned you up, I adorned you, I married you, and then you turned and ran away from me, you know. Um, and then in the New Testament, we have the example of the church, being the bride of Christ and us together being presented as beautiful um, and it's fitting to be married into, into uh, Christ um, and how we as a church uh, need to be prepared and ready um, to take our place and to have our role alongside Christ our Lord. Um, you know, it's about structure and, uh, you know, we've got example after example after example um, of structure uh, and it's uh, and, and it helps us when we see structure in the family from you know parents from children to parents from wives to husbands um, from believer to church from church to Christ from Christ to father uh, we can we can understand the the relationship and the order um, that we should be giving to each other um, uh, you know um, you know, to honor God. But the, the interesting thing is there's this superpower, you know, because, um, uh, you know, let me go to the next one. Um, if you think about what Peter's saying here is that by being quiet and gentle and, and chaste and pure, a wife can actually, you know, bring a husband round to Christ. Now that doesn't mean that the wife might not tell the the husband something about the gospel, but what he's saying here is, look, um, if you go and preach, you know, constantly preach to your husband, your non-believing husband, uh, it's not going to work. You know, you know that's not kind of how this is going to work. You know, you um, what you have to do is submit in faith to real power and real freedom. Um, if we go back, you know, it was saying, look, when Sarah submitted to Abraham and called him Lord, you know, um, it, she had a sort of freedom. And, you know, and, and the woman and Peter said to the women, to the wives of that day, you know, follow her example, be her daughter, trust in God, use faith, use faith as your superpower to convert your husbands. To submit and to win over the uh, through quiet and gentle spirit is countercultural in a society which tells women that freedom is won through power. Yeah. So today we have this uh, kind of if you want to have a voice, if you want to achieve things, you have to be loud and you have to you have to use power. And and this is saying no. Um, actually, through the power of God, through your prayer and your petition and your quiet and gentle spirit and your service and your purity, um, you're going to say there's something special in your life to your husband and your husband is going to notice it. And he's going to, and you know, if he's going to be called, he's, if he's called, he's going to react to it and respond to it. And he might say, Hey, tell me more about your God. Um, but you know, uh, this is, this is the message that Peter is giving. And it is an amazing thing. It's a superpower. And it's absolutely countercultural, and and the, pro the problem with countercultural means it means it goes against the kind of logic of the day and the zeitgeist of the day, and it means it has to be founded in faith. You have because you're going against you're going against the tide, 
Um, you're going against the the way that you know we would normally go and solve problems through kind of loud action. Really, in this case, it's through a quiet and gentle spirit and um, and and purity and, and gentleness. So Peter tells us that um, unrequested preaching to husbands will be counterproductive. A quiet and gentle spirit in human terms is a powerful expression of a wife's trust in God. And verse 6 tells us, ironically, wives have real freedom through acting in faith rather than fear when following the example of Sarah. I know this is really challenging stuff um, because obviously it's countercultural um, and uh, the best meaning, you know, the most, the I'm sure the you know, a very, very well-meaning Christian wife will want to preach to her husband and uh, but it's about finding the right way to do that and and that that takes me to my next point about equality but you know submission doesn't mean you don't have a voice i think in this case though um what peter's saying is that you know preaching to your husbands uh, and changing them wasn't going to wasn't was going to actually be counterproductive uh it doesn't mean that you don't have a role in, in the family in the household and in the marriage in the relationship you know um, I think, you know, a, a marriage would be a pretty uh, dead place if it was a one-way conversation. Um, but submission, in the end, uh, means that, you know, what you offer is presented in a certain way. And it's a, it's, a hard, it's a hard teaching, you know. I mean, this one's saying, don't even be nice, but actually do it silently through your heart. But I think that example from, um, from Sarah and Abraham, you know, is that, you know, God had a role and God has roles for women all through the Bible and he had a role for Sarah and sometimes Sarah you know acted with wisdom and sometimes she didn't you know and she didn't believe you know there's there's all sorts of times when characters you know had had a role to play positively and a role to play negatively and uh, you know Sarah is you know is honored um, for her role but I mean I've got to take what Peter says here that uh, you know um, I mean, you know, we're reading it from, from, from Peter's words himself. For in this way, in former times, holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I mean, you know, we see how, you know, he called, she called him Lord. It doesn't mean that she never said anything in the house or never talked to him or probably never even argued with him. But, uh, um, but how she argued and, and with the respect that she used, um, I can only imagine when she's called out as the grand example to give to all these wives across the region that it must have been, um, you know, pretty respectful. So the, the, the husband needs to see something special in you and then inquire about it and then you can share with them your faith and then you can find different ways to share your faith with them. But when you basically say to your husband, you're in the wrong, then that's when things perhaps get out of, get out of the order that God has, said, uh, has, has defined. Um, so this is about equality, right? So what does verse 7 tell us about the value of a wife in the first century? Now, the thing is, in verse 7, um, let me just read it again. Uh, Husbands, in the same way, be considered to, um, as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and the heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so, uh, of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Actually, this was quite shocking because in the first century, um, wives weren't heirs, and they certain they certainly weren't. Um, uh, what is it? Um, um, as fellow heirs, you know, as heirs with you. Depends on the translation. Either fellow heirs or heirs with you. So Peter's saying, look, your wives have the e equal status as you in God. In Christ and uh, you know they're they're going to be you know they're heirs to the um, the, the richness of, of Christ's kingdom and uh, you know the, the next life and all the other things that come with it um, so you know so the message is that submission does not mean of less value uh, in Christ we are equally treasured and um, you know we've got the example of Christ lowering himself to the role of son and, and being obeyed by the father uh, and obeying the father so i've, I've missed this type that christ submitting to his parents christ being baptized even though he didn't need to do it he did it to set the right example christ submitting to palace justice 
Christ was in no way in fear to Pilate, but, but Christ obeyed the law because that was the right ordered thing to do. Christ didn't need to be baptized, but he, he was baptized so that for righteousness. In other words, the so people would see the example and follow it because they did need to be baptized. Christ, you know, probably knew better than his parents, but it submitted to his parents. Um, in no way was he ever worth less than his parents. He, you know, Christ is God. Um, and Christ, of course, was, is equal to the Father. Um, and um, But, you know, as it says in Philippians, you know, didn't think that equality was something to keep hold on, but to grasp, and, and so um, allowed, you know, came down as the sun and came in human form and lived, a, uh, you know, and was humbled basically as a human uh, born in a manger to die on a cross. So, you know, we have also have in Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And, uh, you know, and this sent an earthquake through the contemporary attitudes um, to women, you know, sh and show her honour as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered, hindered. you know. See her as someone who is equal in Christ um, so that it's not something that holds back your relationship with God. Um, you know, honour your wives, respect your wives, understand your wives. Um, you know, understand that they have a role to play and you have a role to play, but that doesn't make them any less equal. In fact, they are absolutely equal in the eyes of God, as it says in Galatians. Uh, and the irony is that just as it's countercultural today to, to, to allow a husband, perhaps, um, to, to approach, to approach uh, the challenge of his faith, uh, in a, you know, through faith, rather than perhaps um, and more directly. Um, you know, it is just as countercultural back in the first century to turn around and tell the people listening that a wife is a fellow heir because in those days, a wife was property. And there's a reason it was called, you know, a marriage contract because women were property inside that contract. And of course, that's something that we wouldn't uh, see today. I don't know when that kind of thing uh, disappeared. Probably not as far back as, as we think, but uh, the point is, uh, you know, in, in the first century to turn around and say, honour your wife as a fellow heir was actually a very ch challenging thing to say and very countercultural as well. So finally, uh, we've got God is a God of order, not chaos. Submission and faith is a real power and freedom. And submission does not mean less value. In Christ, we are equally treasured. And Finally, Philippians 2, 3 to 11, uh, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he exited in the, existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. And, making, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which was above every name, so that, the name of Jesus, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess, confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And when you take, you know, when you take all this together, what it's saying is everyone is in submission. Everyone is in a structure. You know, um, we all have to submit to the authorities, submit to the church elders, submit to our husbands, submit to our parents, uh, you know, submit to, um, submit to Christ. Um, that, you know, submission is everywhere. It is absolutely everywhere. And, um, but in doing it, actually there is power because if we're doing it in faith actually that faith will will move mountains um and we're not just doing it in fear or in case you know we, we're worried about the person above us um it's one thing to know that the state has the power over us but uh you know we sh you know as as uh, the bible says we need to 
a be our masters as if Christ is our master, you know, not just when our masters are looking, you know, because there's lots of things we could do when our masters aren't looking, which, you know, the sort of thing we discussed last week. If we don't really have faith, if we don't really know that we're, we're, we're submitting for the glory of God and we're submitting in faith and submitting that we're doing it in service to Christ, actually, you know, that submission is, is really just in fear in case, you know, we get into trouble or to further our, you know, position that one day we might become masters ourselves. Um, and it, it's faith is the key um, to all of this. So I know it's a difficult thing, and, uh, and um, obviously I, I'm just one person with one view, and, um, and I just, uh, of course, if you, anyone wants to challenge it, do, do feel free to challenge it, and, uh, or talk to me later, or talk to me openly, um, and uh, you know we can pray about it together.